so good morning everyone so in the series of our lectures by our residents now this is the time to uh, learn what are the cardio use drugs used in cardiovascular drug used for cardiovascular system in palliative medicine so uh, for this lecture uh, kashish kashish is a second year junior resident md in palliative medicine at tmh uh she is also a certified eco pediatric palliative care provider and she is member of team that won the first prize in iapc annual quiz at apcon 2022 very good kashish and uh, her area of interest are palliative medicine in icu and palliative medicine in non malignant chronic diseases and uh, to moderate kashish uh, we have a very uh, renowned person in india is dr raghu tota who has joined palliative medicine department at uh, tmh uh, recent uh, maybe few years back but uh, he is a famous person in area of pain med pain medicine all over india as well as uh, initially he was in onco anesthesia he has done his fellowship in pain medicine in singapore and uh, he has got lot of position he is holding right now that the editorial board of pain physician journal he was a founder president of society of integrated pain and palliative care he was also founder secretary society of onco and is founder secretary of society of onco anesthesia and palliative peri operative care he is executive member of indian society of study of pain and uh, he is also uh, taking lot of md anesthesia exam and dm onco anesthesia exam his experience and clinical interest in practice are is corresponding author first indian cancer pain management guidelines so cancer pain management guidelines which was published recently he was the main or corresponding author of that those guidelines his special interest lies in cancer pain refractory cancer pain interventional cancer pain advanced cancer planning end of life care and palliative care in icu i think the residents at tmh are very lucky so that lot of things they can learn and they can also learn integration of intervention plus uh, pharmacological therapy in cancer pain management he has received lot of honors and awards a uh, recipient of navratna award by om padma shri seva sangh he was also awarded by guinness world record certificate for conquering flag hosting for organ donation drive he has got high index google scholar 10 with more than 50 publication in peer reviewed journal journals uh he is authored several chapters in national and international book so you uh you are very lucky that today kashish and raghu will explain you what are the drugs which should be knowing in palliative medicine which are used in cardiovascular system so kashish you can start work please thank you all of you can please send your question answer in chat box we will take all the questions at the end thank you can start uh... thank you ma'am am i audible yes you are audible and we can see your slides the only thing you have to make the slide show good morning everyone today we will be discussing cardiovascular drugs in palliative care for the purpose of this seminar we will be classifying these drugs broadly into direct acting drugs which directly act on the cardiovascular system and includes adrenergic agonist adrenergic antagonist digoxin vasodilators and calcium channel blockers and the drugs that indirectly act on the cardiovascular system include diuretics ace inhibitors angiotensin receptor blockers and angiotensin receptor necrolysin inhibitors now first coming to the mechanism of heart failure so congestive heart failure is accompanied by compensatory neurohormonal responses which includes activation of sympathetic neurons and uh, renin angiotensin aldosterone axis this causes increased ventricular afterload due to systemic vasoconstriction and chamber dilatation causing depression in systolic function additionally this increased afterload and the direct effects of angiotensin and non epinephrine on the ventricular myocardium cause pathologic remodeling characterized by progressive chamber dilatation and loss of contractile function reducing to uh, reducing cardiac output and further leading to cardiac remodeling 
now the stages of heart failure uh, heart failure is divided into four stages stage a it is also the at risk for heart failure so at risk of heart failure but uh, there is no current or previous symptoms and signs of heart failure and there is no structural or functional heart disease or abnormal biomarkers for example patients with hypertension cerebrovascular disease diabetes obesity and exposure to cardiotoxic agents stage b is pre heart failure in this patients are without current or previous signs and symptoms of heart failure but have evidence of structural heart disease or evidence of increased filling pressures or risk factors and increased natriuretic peptide levels or persistently elevated cardiac troponin in absence of any other diagnosis c is the symptomatic heart failure in which patients have current or previous signs and symptoms of heart failure the last stage is stage d the advanced heart failure with marked heart failure symptoms that interfere with daily life and recurrent hospitalization despite attempts to optimize with guideline directed medical therapies now the first class of drugs we will be discussing is adrenergic agonists uh adrenergic agonists are broadly classified as direct acting further classified as selective and non selective then there is mixed acting and then the indirect acting drugs which includes releasing agents uptake inhibitors monoamine oxidase inhibitors and catechol o methylase inhibitors in this we will be discussing the non selective direct acting adrenergic agents now the effects of epinephrine and non epinephrine will be discussed on the heart blood pressure and peripheral circulation epinephrine increases the heart rate slightly with moderate increase in stroke volume and significant increase in cardiac output and the chances of arrhythmias and moderate increase in coronary blood flow whereas norepinephrine reduces the heart rate moderately increases stroke volume with no changes in cardiac output significant chances of arrhythmias and moderate in coronary blood flow coming to blood pressure epinephrine significantly increases increases the systolic blood pressure mildly increases diastolic and mean arterial pressure whereas moderately increasing the mean coronary pressure norepinephrine significantly increases the systolic blood pressure moderately increases the mean diastolic uh, mean arterial and mean pulmonary pressure in peripheral circulation total peripheral resistance is decreased by epinephrine whereas cerebral and muscular blood flow and splanchanic blood flow are increased with non epinephrine total peripheral resistance is moderately increased with no changes in cerebral muscular and splanchanic blood flow and reduction in cutaneous and renal blood flow this the graph showing the effects of intravenous infusion of norepinephrine epinephrine and isoprotenol on pulse rate blood pressure and peripheral resistance so on iv epinephrine there is moderate increase in systolic blood pressure due to increased cardiac contractility and rise in cardiac output peripheral resistance decreases due to action on beta 2 receptors of vessels in skeletal muscle whereas blood flow is enhanced and diastolic pressure usually falls now on iv norepinephrine systolic and diastolic blood pressure and pulse pressure all increase cardiac output is unchanged or decreased and total peripheral resistance is raised compensatory vagal reflex activity slows the heart and increases the stroke volume peripheral vascular resistance increases whereas renal blood flow decreases on iv isoprotenol peripheral vascular resistance decreases diastolic blood pressure falls whereas systolic remains unchanged or rises slightly cardiac output increases due to positive inotropic and chronotropic effect of the drug so dopamine so dopamine has a dose dependent action with low dose there is activation of d2 receptors and reduction of alpha adrenergic stimulation this causes increase in renal blood flow and maintenance of gfr on intermediate doses there is stimulation of cardiac alpha and beta 1 receptors this causes increased heart rate contractility and av conduction further increasing the cardiac output and systolic blood pressure 
on higher doses there is stimulation of alpha adrenergic peripheral receptors causing vasoconstriction and increase in total peripheral resistance it is the beta agonist of choice for management of congestive heart failure with systolic dysfunction principal hemodynamic effect is to increase stroke volume from positive inotropy although beta 2 receptor activation may cause decrease in systemic vascular resistance and mean arterial pressure continuous infusion are typically initiated at 2 to 3 micrograms per kg per minute without a loading dose and up regulated until the desired hemodynamic response is achieved pharmacological tolerance may limit infusion efficacy beyond 4 days the recommendation of inotropes in congestive heart failure these recommendations are according to the 2022 aha acc hfsa collaborative guidelines for management of heart failure in patients with advanced heart failure refractory to guideline directed medicalized therapy and device therapy who are eligible for an awaiting mechanical cardiac support or cardiac transplantation continuous intravenous inotropic support is reasonable as bridge therapy in selected patients with stage d heart failure despite optimal gdmt and device therapy who are ineligible for either mechanical cardiac support or cardiac transplantation continuous intravenous inotropic support may be considered as palliative therapy for symptom control and improvement in functional status in patients with heart failure long term use of either continuous or intermittent intravenous inotropic agents for reasons other than palliative care or as a bridge to advanced therapies is considered potentially harmful next class of drugs we will be discussing is adrenergic antagonists broadly classified as alpha receptor antagonists and beta receptor antagonists alpha receptor antagonists includes the non selective alpha 1 selective and beta 2 selective whereas beta receptor antagonists include non selective first generation beta 1 selective second generation and non selective and beta 1 selective coming under third generation so amongst the beta blockers the drug we will be discussing is metoprolol mechanism of action is selective inhibition of beta 1 receptors with and it is used in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction myocardial infarction and angina starting dose is 50 mg once daily per oral and maximum dose is up to 400 mg in 24 hours t half is 3 to 4 hours and onset of action is 1 hour side effect include dizziness headache tiredness bradycardia rash pruritus and diarrhea caution should caution is advised in prescribing to patients with type 2 diabetes mellitus hyperthyroidism and myasthenia gravis contraindications include severe bradycardia and hypersensitivity drug interactions of beta blockers is that nsaids may diminish the therapeutic effects of beta blockers the recommendation of beta blockers in congestive heart failure is that in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction with current or previous symptoms use of one of the three beta blockers which is bisoprolol metoprolol and carvedilol is proven to reduce mortality in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction with current or previous symptoms beta blocker therapy provides high economic value next class next drug we'll be discussing is digox so mechanism of digoxin includes inhibition of plasma membrane sodium potassium atpase in myocytes a positive inotropic effect is uh, seen on the failing myocard there is suppression of rapid ventricular rate response to chf associated atrial fibrillation also there is regulation of downstream deleterious effects of sym sympathetic nervous system overactivation coming to pharmacokinetics oral bioavailability of digoxin is 60 to 80% with t half of 36 to 48 hours it is 25% plasma protein bound and steady state concentration is achieved in 7 days the elimination is through the kidneys and a maintenance dose of 0.125 to 0.25 mg per day toxicity so one person patient develop digoxin toxicity it is caused due to increased intracellular calcium and av nodal blockage from increased vagal tone the cardiac symptoms that are present is palpitations 
syncope and extra cardiac symptoms might include dizziness fatigue restlessness nausea vomiting and visual disturbances Patho pathognomonic ecg finding is by directional ventricular tachycardia but ecg changes can be according to the type of arrhythmia or the heart the antidote is decoxin specific antigen uh, antibody antigen binding fragment the recommendation for digoxin is in patients with symptomatic heart failure with reduced ejection fraction despite guideline directed medical therapy or who are unable to tolerate it digoxin might be considered to decrease hospitalization for heart failure next class of drugs is diuretics so diuretics is classified conventionally as high efficacy diuretics including furosemide bumetanide and toracemide Moderate efficacy diuretics include thiazides like hydrochlorothiazide and benzoflumethiazide, and thiazide-related diuretics like metolazone and chlorthalidone and indamin. Low efficacy diuretics include potassium sparing diuretics like aldosterone antagonist, including spironolactone and epilirinone, and inhibitors of renal sodium channel like triamterene and amylorin. Other low efficacy diuretics are osmotic diuretics like mannitol, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors like esetazolamide and dorazolamide, uh, which are not currently used as diuretics. The mechanism and site of action. So, esetazolamide, that is a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, act on proximal tubule, which increases the excretion of bicarbs. Second, uh, acting drug is mannitol, which acts on proximal tubule and collecting duct. It is an osmotic diuretic, which increases the water excretion. Third comes the loop diuretics that act on the thick ascending limb of loop of Henle, causing sodium, potassium and chloride excretion through sodium, potassium and chloride co-transport. Then thiazide diuretics act on distal convoluted tubule and increases sodium and chloride excretion. Lastly, aldosterone antagonists act in the collecting duct and the distal part of distal convoluted tubule, increasing sodium excretion and increasing potassium retention. Now, the, firstly, we'll discuss loop diuretics. These are sulfonamide derivatives, which act on the thick ascending limb of loop of Henle by inhibition of sodium potassium chloride co-transporter. They inhibit sodium and water resorption increase urinary excretion of potassium, magnesium, hydrogen, and chloride ions. The pharmacokinetics of furosemide, bumetanide, and teracemide is bioavailability of furosemide is 60 to 70 percent, of bumetanide is 80 to 95 percent, and of teracemide is approximately 80 percent. Onset of action for paroral furosemide is 30 to 60 minutes, subcutaneous furosemide is 30 minutes, and intravenous furosemide is 2 to 5 minutes. For paroral bumetanide is 30 to 60 minutes, and for intravenous bumetanide is less than or equal to 2 minutes. For paroral teracemide is within 60 minutes, and for intravenous teracemide is within 10 minutes. Tmax of paroral furosemide is 1.5 hours, of paroral bumetanide is 0 0.5 to 2 hours, of paroral teracemide is within 1 hour. Plasma half-life, so plasma half-life for furosemide in a healthy patient is 0 0.5 to 2 hours, in patients with congestive heart failure ranges from 1 to 6 hours, in patients with end-stage renal disease is up to 10 hours. For bumetanide, half-life is one to two hours. For teracemide, it is 3.5 hours. Duration of action of paroral furosemide is four to six hours. Of subcutaneous furosemide is four hours. And for intravenous furosemide is two hours. For bumetanide paroral, duration of action is four to six hours. Intravenous bumetanide is two hours. For teracemide, the duration of action is within eight hours. Equivalent doses. So 40 milligrams of furosemide is equivalent to 1 milligram of bumetanide, which is equivalent to 10 milligrams of teracemide. Now, common indications of furosemide are ascites due to portal hypertension, which is transudative type, fluid overload in congestive heart failure and end-stage renal failure, breathlessness due to acute pulmonary edema, hypertension, which is unresponsive to usual treatment, and forced diuresis and hypercalcemia management. 
coming to the adverse effects adverse effects include hypokalemic metabolic alkalosis dehydration hypomagnesemia hypocalcemia hyperuricemia hyperglycemia hyperlipidemia and autotoxicity caution is advised when using in aneuric renal failure hepatic impairment and hypersensitivity to sulfonamides now drug interactions hypokalemia can be caused with other calcium depleting agents like glucocorticoids beta 2 agonist amphotericin hyponatremia with other sodium depleting agents like carbamazepine nephrotoxicity can occur with uh, concurrent use with nsaids and aminoglycosides and autotoxicity can occur with aminoglycosides carboplatin and paclitaxel next drug we'll be discussing is pyrinolactone the site of action is late distal convoluted tubule and collecting ducts containing the cytosolic mineralocorticoid receptors its mechanism of action is competitive inhibition of aldo uh, competitively inhibiting binding of aldosterone to mineralocorticoid uh, receptors it is a potassium sparing diuretic For, pharm for pharm pharmacokinetics uh, spironolactone is 65% uh, uh, bioavailability per orally it undergoes first pass metabolism it is highly protein bound with a t half life of 1.6 hours which increases up to 9 hours in liver cirrhosis indications of spironolactone includes uh, includes cirrhotic or malignant ascites associated with portal hypertension resistant hypertension primarily due to uh, primary hyperaldosteronism refractory edema mostly due to secondary hyperaldosteronism and severe congestive heart failure now in cirrhotic or malignant ascites due to portal hypertension so spironolactone is a diuretic of choice in liver cirrhosis it starts uh, starting dose is 100 mg per oral spironolactone with 40 mg of per oral furosemide every morning increase both every 3 to 5 days in a ratio of 100 is to 40 typical maintenance dose of spironolactone is 200 to 300 mg per day with maximum dose of 400 to 600 mg per day monitor body weight renal function and serum electrolytes elimination of ascites may take 10 to 28 days in severe congestive heart failure it is used in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction with symptomatic uh, symptoms persistent on ace inhibitors and beta blockers starting dose is 12.5 to 25 mg per oral once daily and check for serum potassium and creatinine after 4 to 7 if necessary increase up to 25 to 50 mg per oral once daily after a month check serum potassium and creatinine after one week for resistant hyper resistant hypertension it is used as fourth line add on therapy starting dose is 25 mg per oral once daily typical dose is 25 to 50 mg once daily maximum dose up to 100 mg in 24 hours it should not be prescribed if serum potassium is more than 4.5 mmol per liter now coming to the adverse effects of spironolactone it can cause life threatening hyperkalemia gynecomastia reduced libido menstrual irregularities and hirsutism cns disturbances like drowsiness lethargy confusion and headache can manifest and gi disturbances including diarrhea dyspepsia gastritis and peptic ulcerations for caution severe hyperkalemia with other potassium sparing drugs like ace inhibitors arps cyclosporine low molecular weight heparin tacrolimus and nitrofurantoin can be present is advised when using in patients who are elderly with renal impairment and diabetic now thiazide diuretics the mechanism of action is inhibition of sodium and chloride co transport and uh, it works at distal convoluted tube it is used for edema as an adjunctive to loop diuretics for hypertension and prevention of calcium nephrolithiasis dose is approximately 25 to 100 mg per edema maximum up to 200 mg side effects include hypotension electrolyte imbalance including hypokalemia hyponatremia hypocalcemia hyperuricemia and hypomagnesemia
recommendation for diuretic and digestive heart failure is in patients with heart failure who have fluid retention diuretics are recommended to relieve congestion improve symptoms and prevent worsening of the heart failure for patients with heart failure and congestive symptoms addition of a thiazide to treatment with a loop diuretic should be reserved for patients who do not respond to moderate or high dose loop diuretics to minimize electrolyte abnormalities in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and nyha class 2 to 4 symptoms an aldosterone antagonist like spironolactone or aplerinone is recommended to reduce morbidity and mortality if gfr is more than 30 mg per minute per 1.73 m square and serum potassium is less than 5 mg per liter in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and nyh class 2 to 4 symptoms aldosterone antagonist therapy provides high economic benefit in patients taking mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist whose serum potassium cannot be maintained at less than 5.5 mg equals per liter mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist should be discontinued to avoid life threatening hyperkalemia Now, recommendation of diuretics in CHF doses for bumetanide is 0.5 to 1 milligrams once or twice a day, with maximum dose to 10 milligrams. Furosemide is 20 to 40 milligrams once or twice a day, with maximum up to 600 milligrams, and toracemide is 10 to 20 milligrams once with 200 milligrams maximum daily dose. For thiazide diuretics. Low thiazide is two fifty to five hundred milligrams once or twice a day with thousand milligrams to maximum dose. Low thalidone is twelve point five to twenty five milligrams once a day initial dosing with hundred milligrams maximum dosing. Hydrochlorothiazide twenty five milligrams once or twice a day with two hundred milligrams maximum dose. Indapamide two point five milligrams once a day up to five milligrams maximum dose and metolazone. Uh, twenty two point five milligrams once, all the way up to twenty milligrams to be the maximum. Next drugs we'll be discussing is ACE inhibitors, ARBs, and ARN inhibitors. Uh, in the ACE inhibitors, that is angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, we'll be discussing rapidly. So mechanism of action is reversible inhibition of angiotensin converting enzyme. Use of ACE inhibitors is high uh, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and hypertension for both the starting dose is 2.5 mg once daily evaluation response uh, every 2 to 4 weeks with maximum dose titrated up to 20 mg per day so or uh, Ramipril undergoes triphasic uh, triphasic elimination with immediate p half of nine to eighteen hours. Onset of action is within one to two hours, and duration of action is approximately twenty four hours. Side effects include cough, hypotension, headache, dizziness, nausea, angina, and hyperkalemia. Contraindications is known hypersensitivities and diabetes mellitus patients on elisquire. Drug interactions is. Angiotensin receptor blockers may enhance adverse effects of ACE inhibitors. NSAIDs may enhance nephrotoxicity, and angiotensin receptor nephrolysin inhibitors enhance changes of uh, chances of angina. Uh, next, we'll be discussing angiotensin receptor blockers. The drug we'll be discussing is Telmisart. So, mechanism of action is angiotensin two receptor block blocks vasoconstriction action and aldosterone. Uh, secreting effects of angiotensin. It is used in cardiovascular risk reduction, acute coronary syndrome, and hypertension. Uh, starting dose is twenty to forty milligrams once daily, uh, to a maximum up to eighty milligrams in twenty-four hours. T half is approximately twenty-four hours, with onset of action within one to two hours, and duration of action is less than twenty-four hours. Side effects of telmisartan include upper respiratory tract infection. back pain sinusitis diarrhea contraindications include known hypersensitivity of the drug and drug interactions are nsaids may decrease the therapeutic effect of angiotensin receptor blockers and angiotensin receptor blockers may enhance serum concentration next is angiotensin receptor nephrolysin inhibitors uh, it is a combination drug sacubitril plus valsartan causes inhibition of angiotensin receptor nephrolysin then indication is uh, heart failure 
half life of sacubitril is 1 to 4 hours and half life of valsartan is 9.9 .9 hours side effects and caution include hypotension hyperkalemia increase in serum creatinine contraindications include known hypersensitivity history of angina Interactions is angiotensin receptor blocker may diminish the therapeutic effect of sacubitril and ACE inhibitors may enhance the toxic effect of sacubitril. Now the dosages for uh, sacubitril and valsartan is patients previously on moderate to high dose of ACE inhibitors. So initially sacubitril 49 milligrams and valsartan 50, uh, 51 milligrams twice a day should be started, doubling the dose as tolerated after two to four weeks to the target maintenance dose of sacubitril as 97 milligrams and of valsartan is 103 milligrams twice daily. Patients previously on low dose of ACE inhibitors, uh, initially sacubitril 24 milligrams and valsartan 26 milligrams twice daily should be started doubling the dose as tolerated after two to four weeks to the target maintenance dose sacubitril of 97 milligrams and valsartan of 103 milligrams twice daily. Patients not on ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers, initial dose of sacubitril is 24 milligrams and valsartan of 26 milligrams twice daily, doubling the dose as tolerated after two to four weeks to the target maintenance dose sacubitril of 97 milligrams and of valsartan 103 milligrams twice daily. The recommendations of ACE inhibitors, ARBs and ARN inhibitors in CH. In patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and NYHA class 2 to 3 symptoms, the use of ARN inhibitors is recommended to reduce morbidity and mortality. In patients with previous or current symptoms of chronic heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, the use of ACE inhibitors is beneficial to reduce morbidity and mortality when the use of ARN inhibitors is not feasible. In patients with previous or current symptoms of chronic heart failure with reduced ejection fraction who are intolerant to ACE inhibitors because of cough or angioedema and when the use of ARN inhibitors is not feasible, the use of angiotensin receptor blockers is recommended to reduce morbidity and mortality. In patients with chronic symptomatic heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, NYHA class 2 or 3 who tolerate an ACE inhibitors or ARB, replacement by an ARN inhibitor is recommended to further reduce the morbidity and mortality. In patients with previous or current symptoms of chronic heart failure with reduced ejection fraction in whom ARN inhibitors is not feasible, Treatment with an inhibitor is ARB provides high economic value. ARN inhibitors should not be administered concomitantly with ACE inhibitors or within 36 hours of the last dose of an ACE inhibitor. ARN inhibitors and ACE inhibitors should not be administered to, pay, administered to patients with the, any history of angioedema. Next class of drugs is vasodilators. So firstly, in vasodilators, we'll be discussing nitrates. So major action of nitrates is direct non-specific smooth muscle relaxation. Uh, organic nitrates are rapidly denitrated in smooth muscle cell to release a uh, free radical nitric oxide, which activates cytosolic vinyl cyclase. Then increase in CGMP causes depolarization of myosin light chain kinase through a CGMP dependent protein kinase pathway. Now, reduced availability of phosphorylated myosin light chain kinase interferes with activation of myosin, which fails to interact with actin to cause contraction. Consequently, relaxation occurred. Further, raised intracellular uh, CGMP may reduce calcium ion entry, further contributing to relaxation. So, nitrates cause vasodilation of large and medium-sized coronary arteries and arterioles and dilatation of epicardial coronary arteries. It also causes dilation of stenotic epicardial coronary artery segments, improvement in coronary collateral blood flow, vasodilation of systemic and pulmonary arterial veins, vasodilation of capacitance veins, and vasodilation of conductance arteries, which further leads to decreased preload and decreased left ventricular wall tension respectively causing decrease in myocardial oxygen consumption. 
uh, role of glycerol tyanitrate as smooth muscle relaxant and anti spasmodic nitric oxide regulates distal esophageal peristalsis and relaxation of esophageal sphincter hence helps in dysphagia and odynophagia associated with esophagitis and esophageal spasm nitric oxide is major inhibitory neurotransmitter in internal anal sphincter so it helps in relieving painful spasm improving quality of life and aid in healing of painful acute anal fissures now indications of glycerol tyanitrate include dysphagia and odynophagia due to esophagitis acute anal fissure in which it is used um, as local application and for angina on effort st uh, starting dose is one sublingual tablet which in uh, which contains approximately 300 or 600 milli micrograms of uh, glycerol tyanitrate or a spray repeat every 5 minutes until the pain goes or maximum dose is reached that is up to 1.2 mg for prophylactic use take immediately before the activity now adverse effects includes headache postural hypotension and tolerance and interaction is present with uh, pde5 inhibitors it can cause extreme hypotension now tolerance of nitrates frequent repeated or continuous exposure to nitrates can lead to marked attenuation of their pharmacological effects it may result from reduced capacity of vascular smooth muscle to convert nitroglycerin to nitric oxide that is the true vascular tolerance or from activation of mechanisms extraneous to vessel wall uh, this is pseudo tolerance effective approach to restoring responsiveness is to interrupt therapy for 8 to 12 hours per day which allows the feature of efficacy to maintain you should be in, uh, restricted to intermittent use only next vasodilator we'll be discussing is hydralazine its mechanism of action is direct vasodilatation action on arterioles with reduced systemic resistance it is used for hypertension hyper uh, sorry, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction so the starting dose is 25 mg per oral thrice daily with isosorbide dinitrate maximum up to 75 mg three times a day it's used in hypertensive emergency with a dosage of 10 to 20 mg every 4 to 6 hours intravenously or intramuscularly maximum up to 40 mg t half is 3 to 7 hours onset of action for intravenous infusion is 10 to 18 minutes side effects include hypotension angina pectoris acute myocardial infarction and flushing contraindications include rhd cad and mitral valve stenosis drug interaction is with nsaids it may uh, decrease the therapeutic effect <coughs> sorry recommendation for vasodilators in congestive heart failure is in patients with current or previous symptomatic heart failure with reduced ejection fraction who cannot be given first line agents such as arn inhibitors ace inhibitors or arbs because of drug intolerance or renal insufficiency a combination of hydralazine and isosorbide dinitrate might be considered to reduce morbidity and mortality <coughs> <coughs> uh so the last class of drugs we'll be discussing today is calcium channel blockers <clears throat> they are classified as phenylalanine benzodiazepines and dihydropyrimidines so the mechanism of action of calcium channel blockers is uh, calcium channel blockers bind to the alpha 1 subunit of l type calcium channels and reduce the calcium influx through uh the channel uh, this uh, inhibits calcium calmodulin complex which further does not let the phosphorylation of myosin light chain kinase hence promoting relaxation the first drug we'll be discussing is uh, amlodipine uh, its mechanism of action is inhibition of calcium ions from entering slow channels of vascular smooth muscles and myocardium it is used in chronic stable angina and hypertension with an initial dose of 2.5 to 5 mg once daily maximum up to 10 mg in 24 hours t half life is 40 to 50 hours onset of action is within 6 to 12 hours and peak plasma level is achieved in 6 to 9 hours 
Side effects include peripheral edema, flushing, and hypertension. Contraindications are known hypersensitivity. Drug interactions in our uh, CYP3A4 indu uh, inducers may reduce serum concentration of amlodipine. Now, next drug is nifedipine. Its indications are smooth muscle relaxant and antispasmodic. Uh, it's also used for intractable cup due to esophagitis and esophageal spasm used in Raynaud's phenomenon. For uh, stable angina, the dosage is 10 milligrams per oral uh, Q8 hourly, increased every 7 to 14 days. Maintenance dose of 10 to 20 milligrams per oral Q8 hourly up to 20 to 30 milligrams Q6 to 8 hour day. Maximum up to 180 milligrams per day. For hypertension, extended release once daily dosaging of 30 to 60 milligrams is initiated. Increased every 7 to 14 days. Uh, maximum up to 90 to 120 milligrams per day. So, uh, for immediate release nifedipine, per oral bioavailability is 45 to 55%. Onset of action is uh, 15 minutes. Uh, Tmax is 30 to 60 minutes. Plasma half-life is 2 to 3.5 hours. And duration of action is up to 8 hours. Adverse effects of nifedipine include headache, dizziness, vasodilatation, peripheral edema and constipation. The uncommon uh, side effects include asthenia, lethargy, myalgia, postural hypertension, sleep disorder, tremor, abnormal vision, vertigo, and GI disturbances. Uh, in patients with heart failure due to reduced ejection fraction, dihydropyrimidine calcium channel blockers are not recommended for treatment of heart failure. Now, caution and contraindication include acute or unstable angina, cardiac shock, cardiogenic shock, uh, severe aortic stenosis. It should not be given within one month of myocardial infarction. It should not be given in hepatic impairment. And caution uh, with the drugs that inhibit or induce CYP3A4, CYP2D6, CYP1A2, and CYP2C8 and 9. Uh, we will be discussing the palliative care for people living with heart failure. The European Association for Palliative Care Task Force Expert Position Statement on the recommendation and use of drugs in heart failure in patients who have already uh, been referred to the palliative care department. So, routinely stopping any heart failure treatment when starting palliative care is inappropriate as many heart failure treatments, like ACE inhibitors, ARBs and, uh, and angiotensin receptor nebulizer inhibitors are important for symptom. ACE inhibitors, ARBs, and ARN inhibitors may help prevent pulmonary congestion but can uh, cause symptomatic hypertension or the worsening of renal failure. Dose reduction or discontinuation should be individually tailored. Diuretics help maintain hypovolemia and control breathlessness and should be withdrawn unless there is a reason to do so. The patient's condition deteriorates and fluid intake decreases. Diuretic dose reduction should be uh, appropriate. Beta blockers prevent tachycardia or angina, especially in patients with atrial fibrillation and prone to rapid ventricular rate. If need to be reduced or stopped due to symptomatic hypertension or low cardiac output, this should be done gradually and decoxin may become an alternative. In the case of significant bradycardia, beta blockers should be reduced or stopped. Inotropic drugs may provide symptomatic benefit in advanced heart failure as a part of a palliative care approach. The intermittent infusion of intravenous inotropes might sometimes be considered as palliative care intervention in inpatient institutions or even in home care to improve both symptoms and quality. Inotropic drugs should not be started or continued in patients who are actively dying as they usually no longer provide any symptomatic benefit in such situations. Thank you for your patient listening. Uh, excellent, Kashish. Now you go and have water first. <laughs> she was coughing a lot, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, Raghu, please, yes, you can summarize and take the question answer yeah. if there are any. Yes, ma'am. So, uh, it was a wonderful presentation and uh, it was all efforts of Kashish. Thank you, Kashish, and uh, the way uh, she presented it. Uh, so, coming to uh, 
this group of medications, uh, the cardiovascular drugs. So mainly, uh, uh, there are two group of patients who do present uh, to us uh, uh, during our palliative care practices. So one is especially the uh, uh, cardiac uh, congestive heart failure, we call it as. So that's a commonest group. And second group of patients who present are the patients who are in the ICU. So, so who are on all these uh, vasopressors and inotropic supports. So that's why I thought uh, we need to know really what exactly um, uh, uh, are the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamic uh, of this uh, group of medications. Uh, now we, we also encounter a lot of uh, patients who are on uh, anti hypertensive medications. So that's why we have included that other group of medications, beta blockers, and but we have not extensively uh, di dissected uh, this group of medications compared to what uh, the just to heart failure medications. So we thought they are uh, really important. Uh, and also uh, we thought, why don't we uh, present some of the evidences uh, uh, of the best care practices which are there presently ongoing and which have been previously uh, just uh, recently come up uh, as an update from the task force. So these were the things uh, which were very nicely uh, summarized and we are open to take the questions if there are any. Oh, I can't see any questions and I don't understand that why questions are not coming up from palliative medicine resident. But uh, I think for all the residents, those who are doing MD palliative medicine, it is important to learn all the medications because yes. when you will go to any cardiac setup and when you will find, uh, encounter any uh, <coughs> patient with, with the heart failure and somebody will call you to, uh, to take care of this patient as well as cardio palliative care physician, you should be knowing all these medications very well because when to use hydrolyzine in hypertensive crisis, when to use nitrate in cases of esophagitis and other situations as he, she has narrated very well, Kashis has narrated very well. So all these medications are important. Although initially you will find it uh, that uh, how to remember all these medications, but uh, when we started going in a heart failure clinics, we have realized that all these medications, knowing about all these medications, when to stop, when to taper off and when to switch off completely when a patient is actively dying, it is very important because we can't, just cannot go and say that patient is end of a, a heart failure patient and we should stop all these medications or we should taper it off until unless we are not having knowledge about all these medications. So I can see that... Uh, one question is there uh, from Dr. Vishnu that what are the, uh, no, first is Dr. Vishnu role of diuretics in recurrent malignant ascites. Raghu and Dr. Neetu is asking what are the situation where diuretics can be used in, oh, both the people are asking. It's almost the ascites. same question. It's the same question. And uh, uh, that's the commonest medications, uh, especially the spironolactone is the commonest medications which we use uh, uh, in our cases where the patients present with malignant ascites. Yes, it's a recurrent ascites, uh, and um, uh, that's how it is the pharmacological treatment. That is the drug of choice uh, when these patients come to us. So, and I, I don't think there are many other questions. So, if there are no questions, we can stop here. And thank you, Kashish and Raghu, for presenting it so well, systematically, all the medications which everyone should be knowing, those who are doing palliative care practice. And I am I'm sure that they must have not uh, read all these medications in detail themselves. So the, it is important that you should go and review this lecture again and you should learn about all these medications. Thank you, Raghu. And thank you, Kashish. And thank you, everyone, for joining. We'll see you next week before 6.30, next week, Monday. Have a nice week. Bye, Raghu. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Madam. Thank you, Kashish. Thank, Thank you, Kashish.